Well, thank you and uh, good evening. I see some of my fellow fossil hounds out there in the audience, so I better be careful what I say here. Anyway, we're going to the uh, Badlands of South Dakota. More specifically, it's about uh, 50 miles east of the Black Hills near a small town called Scenic. And uh, coming from the east, as you go west along the interstate, why then after about 125 miles, you'll start picking up the uh, topography of the Badlands of South Dakota. But this is typical Badlands topography here. And uh, what you see is a land of high spars and uh, buttes and inaccessible ledges and cliffs in here. And notice these various uh, colored formations in here. Uh, it's, it's more beautiful after a rain. And uh, what causes these colors now? These are various uh, shades of red, um, purple, yellow. They're different oxidation states of iron. But each one of these horizontal bands in here is really a uh, B horizon in a soil profile is what it really is. And that's the iron in there. You see this in soils around here below the uh, humic layer. You run into a zone of accumulation, which is really iron. And so what we have here is successive layers of sediment that were laid down as the Black Hills rose. Then there was uh, sheets of sediments that were washed out into the uh, interior of the plains, layer after layer. And on these layers, of course, we had various groups of um, vertebrates living, many different types of vertebrates. They found over 200 different types of mammals in the uh, Badlands. So these creatures, they would wander around on the, uh, on the alluvial plain here. And of course, they would congregate around watering holes. And then of course, they would die. Their, sediment, their skeletal remains would then sink down into the sediment and become preserved there. There was no oxygen and uh, no predators. And so it was an excellent state of preservation. But you can walk these valleys for many miles and never find one fossil. And then you'll come to a place where there's a whole mess of fossils. And the reason for that, of course, is that you're really uh, finding an old watering hole where they lived. And then, of course, they died there and became entombed. Um, but any creature that dies out on the plains, why well, usually after 20 years, their bones have disintegrated into dust. Even the largest uh, elephant bones in Africa, after 15 or 20 years, there's nothing left. So they have to be entombed in the sediment to be, of course, protected from oxidation, bacteria, and predators. And so what we see here, you can find fossils throughout all of these different units in here, but of course, uh, you can't get up there. That's the whole problem here. But the Badlands now is at once extended a lot farther east than this. Um, but it's being eroded away. And this is soft rocks. That's one of the benefits of this. You can dig these out very, very easily. And uh, But the it's, Badlands is eroding down about uh, a foot every 50 or 100 years. In 500,000 years, there'll be no Badlands left. So there'll be no record of whatever happened here. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the formations here now. Uh, the main unit that we hunt the fossils in is so-called Shadron Formation. It's easily recognized. It's about 50 feet thick, and it's like mounds. You can walk up and down these mounds as long as they're not too wet. If they get too wet, why well, then the clay bundles up under your boots and it's difficult walking. And if it gets too uh, dry, why well, then it fractures into a lot of small popcorn, popcorn sized pieces that are sharp and you don't want to sit on any of those. 
But this, this of course, is your typical Shadron formation in here. And then behind it is the Brule. When people think of the Badlands, they're usually thinking of that Brule formation. So the Shadron and the Brule make up the uh, White River formation, as we call it. And these beds were laid down about 30 million years ago when the Badlands were, when the Black Hills were rising and then uh, releasing layers of sediment out on the uh, plains. And then below the shattering, we have the so-called interior zone. That's another oxidized zone. And that, of course, is again a weathered soil. And this yellowish looking material is the upper part of the Pierre formation. If you walk down these valleys, well, then you're going to run into a, a thick sequence of uh, black shales, which are marine in uh, marine in origin, going back about 70 million years. But this zone in here probably took at least 30 million years to weather, but it's quite thick. And then we're getting up into the uh, uh, Shadron Formation, which I mentioned is about 30 million years old here. And here's another view of it. I think some of the former students here in the audience recognize this in here. This is, again is the Shadron, and there's the uh, there's the uh, Pierre. Up, I mean the uh, Rule up there. Well, here's some students out hunting fossils, and notice they're on the Shadron, and of course you can't really climb up here. But one of the best fossil collecting zones is between the Shadron and the and the brule there. And here's one of the largest creatures that probably ever lived during that interval of time in here. It's called a titanosaur, brown tops. Those got at least eight feet tall at the shoulder, and they're distantly related to a rhinoceros. They're really a cross between a horse, a rhino, and a camel. And you can always tell them by that big sling shit sling sheet arms up here. It's like a sling sheet in here. But there are, their bones, of course, are uh, quite robust, so they're easily preserved. But they lived in the late Eocene, early Oligocene epoch 30 to 35 million years ago. They're not closely related to a rhinoceros in here. And during this interval of time, it wasn't a semi-arid region like it is now. It was a uh, semi-tropical with uh, lush vegetation, meandering streams, and so there's plenty of vegetation. And many of these creatures like this, they call them archaic beasts because they were quite different. I mean, you notice this fellow with that big slingshot side horns up here, and then there was another creature that died out a little before it hit this. These uh, rocks were laid down. It had a uh, head and a uh, neck like a camel, but yet it had claws, no hoofs. And so they were quite unusual. But you see, this semi-tropical climate of less vegetation in the entering streams was changing. The climate was changing. It was getting more seasonable. And you were getting uh, grasslands. In grasslands, uh, grass is difficult on teeth because it contains silica caused by uh, silt that is usually uh, layered on the grass by uh, rain that falls. And so uh, things were changing and we're getting more of the modern day orders of uh, mammals. There's about 18 orders. There were 18 orders back then, but they were quite different looking than they are today. Well, here's the skeletal remains of a uh, Titanothere brontops. And this is in a museum, but notice these bones are quite robust. And what you usually find many times, if you're lucky, is a lower jaw here. Well, here's a young uh, student collector. He's found the lower jaw of a Titanothere in here. And very fortunate because it was in sand, and then he was easy to dig out. He did this in about an hour. 
Of course, in many places in the West, these bones are entombed in hard sandstone, and it's difficult really to, uh, really to get them out. Well, there's a specimen. It's almost complete. Notice it has all the teeth to it. And this has uh, been prepared, and it's in our museum over at the University of Missouri at Flaresheim Hall. But here's another specimen that we dug up several years ago. Now, uh, notice it's almost a complete lower jaw, but notice these large cracks in here. That specimen's been in the ground for millions of years, and of course, there's various earth movements and slumpage and the cracks. Now, if we went and just picked that up, try to remove that the way it is now, it would fall apart. I mean, the teeth would fall out and there'd be major pieces in here. So what you have to do is you have to protect that with a uh, plaster of Paris jacket. And I don't want to go through all of this, but what you really do is you take newspaper and you wet in the newspaper, make it damp, and then you cover the specimen with it. And then you need a bucket and some water and some strips of burlap bag. And uh, then you need plaster of Paris. So you make a slurry out of that plaster of Paris. You dip those strips of burlap in there, long strips of burlap. And then, of course, you slap them over this specimen here. And within an hour, it's hardened and dry. And so you've got it in a state there where you can transport it. Then, of course, the next thing you have to do, this one here has been protected with this uh, plaster of Paris jacket, but now you've got to dig under that, and then you've got to turn it over, and you have to do the same thing on the bottom part. So then you can transport it. You can put it in the back of a vehicle and bounce it around, and nothing's really going to happen to it. Well, here's the uh, nasal horn of a Titanus there. Now this is bone. The modern day rhino, I think it's more or less something like hair that's coming together. Well, here again is a reconstruction of a Titanus there. Now notice, going back in the early Eocene, about 50 million years ago, they were small little fellows, maybe only a couple feet high, hornless, but yet they grew larger, and that's the case with most of your mammals throughout the Eocene, throughout the uh, Cenozoic era here. They started out as little fellows, and most of them were browsers, living off of the leaves on trees and that. But as the climate changed in the middle of the late Eocene, well, then, of course, we uh, get grasslands. So the largest animal that in the lady is signed 35 million years ago, but of course it evolved from these little fellows. Same with the horse. The horse is about the size of a little collie dog back at this interval of time, but they gradually grew much larger in here. Well, there's the teeth of a titanus here. Now, this one probably was an old individual. Most of them are worn down. These teeth look very robust. They're, of course, very large, uh, but yet they're a low crown. They're structurally suited to eating um, things like uh, soft vegetation, like watercress, that grew along these sluggy streams in a subtropical climate. They probably were browsers, and they may have used their tongue to strip the leaves off of trees in here. But here's a real find here. You usually only find the upper part here. But this one had all of your roots here, and so that one's in our museum in here. Now, this is interesting, but you see the uh, Titanus there, although it was a huge, robust beast that could probably take pretty good care of itself, it probably wasn't very smart. Now, notice this is the... Uh, size of the brain for a creature that weighed probably several tons. It had the brain about the size of a man's fist in here. Also notice this curvature in here. That indicates a small brain. 
And then, of course, this, I got this out of a book. I don't know how true it is, but this particular author, he said that the more wrinkles you have in the brain, the smarter the creature is. Well, we've found some casts of the brain of a, of a titanothere, and they were quite smooth, so it probably wasn't very intelligent. Uh, but yet, uh, when, as the climate was very equitable, why well, they, of course, they, they thrived in here. But they died out at the uh, early Oligocene, about 25 million years ago. They left no descendants. And uh, it's, in evolution, it's not the largest and robust creature that always survives. It's those that can change with the changing times. And I like to make an analogy here between that and, of course, economics today. It's not always the company that is the largest that survives. It's, it's like Kodak, if you remember them. They, had, they once hired 200, 300,000 people. Now, of course, they're bankrupt. That's because they couldn't change with the times. So many of these smaller creatures that looked quite uh, feeble, they survived because they could change with changing environment that occurred in about the middle part of the Cenozoic in here. <clears throat> well, here's the first true rhinoceros now. It's about the size of a hog called subhydrocodon. It had no horns on it. And it lived among those larger creatures in here. But at this interval of time, there was really three groups of rhinos. One was this fellow here, which evolved into the modern day rhinoceros, but it crossed the Bering Street land bridge into Eurasia. But there was of these three groups of uh, rhinos, uh, we have subhydrocodon, which is really the first true rhinoceros. And then, of course, there's another one called hydron, which was like a deer. It was a fleet runner. It became extinct. And then there's another one which lived along the waterway. I'll show you a reproduction of one of those. It, uh, it was as big as a hippopotamus in here. Well, this is the, uh, Kathy, I think you found this, didn't you? Yeah, we found this out in the Badlands. This is a skeletal parts of a subhydrocodon after, just after we removed it from the rock. So you can see there's a lot of pieces in here and uh, you have to put this together and we'll go into the laboratory later on here. And this is the reconstructed parts of it now. We still maybe need a tooth up here with it. So this one's in our museum and that's open to the public and you might want to stop by there and spend some time there. Well, here's another uh, rhinos type beast in here. Aquatic rhinoceros metamidodon. It's eight to 14 feet long, barrel shaped, resembling an overgrown modern day hippopotamus. But it lived along these rivers in this swamp-like environment in here. And uh, if you do find some of their skeletal remains, like a hip bone or something like that, why, uh, usually it's in sandstone because the rivers, of course, were choked with sand and that later on by geologic processes became uh, cemented into hard sandstone. So trying to get out one of these uh, fossil parts, skeletal parts, it's quite quite difficult. You have to chip and hammer away. It's not like the rest of these formations where you can almost dig it out with a pick. Well, that's a tooth now. We think that might be the tooth from one of these uh, metamidodons, but it also could be the tooth of a giant uh, pig-like creature in here. So I mentioned these three groups of mammals type mammals, rhinoceros type mammals that were evolving. One was deer-like, the other one was like this large metamidodon, but the only one that survived then was the, uh, the true rhinoceros, hydrocodon.
Now the most uh, common uh, mammal that you find in here is an oreida. This is metacodidon. They're about the size of sheep and they roam these uh, grasslands in huge herds. They probably were as abundant as the bison was a couple of centuries ago on the Great Plains, but this is what you usually find in the brutal formation. And that's the skeletal remains of these uh, oreodonts. And we believe this is an artist's, artist's conception there, but they probably were striped. They probably didn't have a uniform uh, type of a, uh, of a uh, her fur on them here, a covering. But these became extinct again in the Paleocene about three million years ago. They left no descendants. But 99 and 9 tenths percent of all the creatures that ever lived now are extinct. And that's the end result of any type of life, it's extinction. But this is in our museum now. I think we find a better specimen which is being prepared, but that's the skull of an oreodont. But these were once so abundant that collecting porters would just step over. Now you find a lot of them, but they seem to be uh, pretty well weathered and broken up. Well, here's some of the teeth of an oreodont. You find a lot of those, and they're quite diagnostic. Uh, notice the size of them, but notice this tooth in here. If you take another tooth and put it over this, and then clamp it together like you'd go working in a jaw. Why, it's like a scissors. It's great for shredding grass on these grasslands, and that was probably one of the reasons why they became so, so abundant. And we believe they were called cud chewers. Teeth well adapted for chewing uh, coarse grass. Now, here's an interesting specimen. This is the brain cast of an oreodont. Of course, after these creatures die, why then the soft parts will decay, leaving a cavity in there, and then that fills in with sediment and hardness. And then you have a brain cast in here. Don't find very many of those anymore. But here's another, here's a, uh, here's a camel. Pedotherium in here. Well, they lasted until about the Pliocene, about two or three million years ago, but it wasn't very big, maybe a couple of feet high, probably about the size of a sheep. But they, uh, before they died out, they uh, migrated into South America and they became the llamas down there. But the uh, three large groups of mammals here, the camels, the uh, rhinoceroses, and the horse, they first evolved in North America. And then before they died out, they crossed that land bridge into Eurasia and then down into Europe, into Africa and here. But why they died out, we don't know. The horses, of course, died out maybe during uh, less than a million years ago. And why would they, uh, why would they die out? Seems like the environment was well suited. Grasslands, they had long legs, they could outrun predators, but yet they, we don't know what caused many of these creatures to, uh, to become extinct in here. Well, that's the skull of a uh, camel. Not a real good specimen. Maybe someday we'll find a better one. But I might mention here, might mention here that uh, these uh, fossil collecting journeys that we made are, uh, we do this under a permit issued by the U.S. Forest Service. They're pretty kind to us. I mean, I think they uh, were a lot more easy to get along with than many of the ranchers and agate hunters and people who want to turn this place into a wilderness area, things like that. But this here is a predator. Hyenodon hornidus lived through the late Eocene and Ligocene, a time interval representing the formation of the Badlands. But we believe that these may have hunted in packs like the modern-day rhinoceros in the, uh, 
in the plains of Africa today. <clears throat> but they're a, uh, belong to a group called creodonts. They died out, but they're not a carnivore like most of the modern day bears and dogs and creatures like that all belong to the group called a carnivore, carnivorous. <clears throat> But that's a reconstructed one they look like. And here's a specimen that you found, Kathy. It's a uh, probably the lower jaw of a H. horridus in here. Those teeth, they weren't meant for, uh, they didn't evolve for eating grass. But now here's a uh, place, we're about two or three miles northeast of Scenic now. Uh, here's the uh, Shadron Formation, and this is here, we're getting up into the Brule. But right along the contact, we find a lot of tortoises. Now, just why they live there, we don't know. Many of them, we believe, may have lived in, in uh, burrows. But they're near that Shadron Brule contract in here right at the contract. Then you find those over large areas of the Badlands. Well, here's a young collector here. She's found a tortoise in here, Stalmias in here. So it's a well-preserved specimen. It's small. And it's complete. It has all the shells to it. Some of these will even have color markings still left on them in here. Excellent state of preservation with all of the shells, the scoots that form the carapace on it here. But now here is a large specimen. This is, follows about uh, two feet long. It probably weighs about two or three hundred pounds. Now why it's upside down, I don't know. I mean, maybe it, maybe earth movements cause this. Maybe it died that way. But it's a big fellow there. Took us a day or so to dig this fellow up. Well, how do you transport something like that? And so anyway, the uh, students, they managed to build a litter to carry it on. So here it is, it's wrapped up in a uh, plaster of Paris jacket and they put it on their litter. Now they're gonna have to carry it about uh, a mile. Lucky we had two strong boys here, but they were pretty well worn out when they got back to the road and the, and the cars in here. So they had about a walk about a mile. There they are carrying the specimen, but way out in here is where the vehicles were parked. So that's a little, little bit of a trick. Well, here's one of the prime fossil collecting localities. This is about five miles west of Scenic, the town of Scenic, but it's now closed out. Uh, this is a uh, valley called Indian Creek. It's about five miles long and two or three miles wide. There's excellent collecting in here for many years. And uh, so we used to go down there, but going back to about in the 1970s, 80s, uh, this area down in here was owned by ranchers and by the Forest Service. They each had parcels of land. The ranchers probably had several acres, and so did the Forest Service. But gradually, over time, the uh, Forest Service got control of the complete valley down there. And of course, you have a lot of uh, problems now, people wanting to go down there. Uh, First, you have the ranchers. They want to run their cattle down in there. And there's another fellow up here. He wanted to run bison down there. Well, bison are a vicious animal. And uh, then, of course, there's agate hunters. There's two or three uh, clubs of agate hunters. They hunt these fairborn agates along the creeks in here. So they want to keep this open, and so do the, uh, um, the wilderness people. Now, they want to... Uh, make it into a wilderness area. And so the Forest Service is under quite a bit of stress. They get about 30,000 requests for information or for permits a year. Uh, 
everything from somebody wanted to put a building in or run a road across it. And so uh, sometimes getting permits is kind of difficult. But anyway, about two years ago, I then uh, the Forest Service, they ran a survey up and down this valley. And they found an endangered species of plant that are doing that in a lot of places throughout the West. Why then, of course, if you have an endangered species, a plant or animal, then you can't have people down there. But now, evidently, this is, uh, they say it's closed out. So we had to go somewhere else, northeast of scenic, a couple miles to do our collecting in here. So I don't know what's going to happen to this. Uh, Forest Service seems to like us because we're uh, less offensive than most of the rest of them. I've been over there already at their wall ranger station. There's been some pretty vicious arguments, especially when prairie dogs from the Forest Service are migrating onto the rancher's land and making big holes there, and so they battle each other. And uh, so we don't know what's really going to happen to this area down in here, but we'll go down there anyway and take a look at it. So this here is Indian Creek. It's meandering. And we had a permit up until about two or three years ago going five miles up that valley. So you have to uh, jump that creek there. Now here's a uh, view of the creek. Now this... Uh, it's a sand bottom. Usually it's pretty hard. You can run a vehicle over, but it's interesting that if it gets something like along the uh, banks here, if that gets too much water, then it turns into quicksand. And so some of these banks are at least five foot high, so you have to try to get up those. And there's these, well, I think there's about 10 or 15 of these before we get to that collecting site at the upper end of this valley in here. Well, here's someone who made it. You recognize that? That's, that's probably Dan's uh, Gila Monster there, a diesel-powered vehicle. It's great for pulling uh, other vehicles out of the muck. But of course, trying to get up these embankments. You see, a, uh, a vehicle with a long wheelbase like this is difficult. And now a Jeep with a small wheelbase is a lot easier to do it. You get hung up here and then you got to dig your way out. Well here we got a flat tire. But, uh, but notice it's only flat on one side there so we just turned it around and we we go. Well I thought I'd include that just to show you that we and academically aren't completely uh, devoid of mirth and humor. <laughs> yeah, you've been a flat tire. That, you, that's the least of your problems. Well, let's go uh, see. We're down in Indian Creek now, and of course, the uh, shattered and the brewer above us. But this here is a uh, we pass a bank of Pierre Shale now. This is the oldest formation exposed in the Badlands. Usually you don't consider that to be Badlands, uh, but yet it's part of that particular area in there. But it's a dark gray shale between 65 and 75 million years old. That was laid down during the Cretaceous period when shallow inland seas spread, spread across what is now the Great Plains. But of course, the sediments that form these Beds came from the rising Rocky Mountains in the west, and all, so all you get in here is uh, layers of volcanic ash. But you can walk these uh, Indian Creek many miles and you don't find a fossil, and all of a sudden you will come to the uh, place where it's just loaded with specimens. And what's the reason for that? We didn't have any answer for that for many years. now. Many of you may have heard about these black smokers that they find in the modern day seafloor, like along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's just masses of uh, boiling water coming up. It's black, they call them black smokers. And it's loaded with various types of minerals like iron and uh, uh, sulfur, various types. And that is a uh, 
excellent type of environment for certain types of anaerobic bacteria to live. And so they feasted on this sulfur and iron that was coming up, and then, of course, this is part of the food chain. Then you start getting various invertebrates like clams and snails and that living off of that, and then come in the larger creatures like some of these marine reptiles. And many of them died right there. But all throughout Wyoming and the South Dakota, you find mounds of shell material. They're actually uh, much more resistant than the surrounding rock, and so they'll stand up like humps in many places. And they're just loaded with shells. So we believe that those may have been some of these smokers on the bottom of that uh, Cretaceous seaway. And black water mixed with all these different elements and ingredients were being emitted on the bottom of that Cretaceous sea floor. And that was an excellent place for these uh, various types of uh, bacteria that are at the bottom of the food chain of live. And so that particular spot in there, that yielded a mass of different types of invertebrates. I can only show you a few of them. Well, there's a better view of this uh, mend here in the Pierre Shale. But notice up in here, here's the Shadron and there's the Brule up there. So you're going back at least to 70 million years here when this was a vast seaway. And if you're lucky, you may find the remains of a plesiosaur or of a mosasaur in there, which are large swimming reptiles. Also, tortoises and, uh, well, here's a fella digging away. You find mostly clams, ammonites, cephalopods, a few crabs. But vertebrate fossils include swimming reptiles, fish, all are sea creatures and attest to the marine origin of the Pierre Shale. Well, one of the major specimens you find in this Pierre is a Inoceramus. It's a large clam. And some of those clams got as big as this desktop here. They were huge. And uh, usually you find the shells that are separated. This is rather rare to find the two shells together because when a clam dies, why, of course, the uh, soft parts and the ligaments holding them together, they decay and then the shells will open up. So you only find one shell, you find the shells disassociated. Well, here's some of the other fossils we find in here. Here's an Inoceramus, and then there's a Didymoceros. And this one over in here is, of course, a uh, Baculites. These are cephalopods. And uh, they're related to, uh, well, they're a distant color, cousin to squids. I mean, they, uh, they're, of course, extinct. Now, this one here would coil, and some of these were straight shells. Some of them got to be huge. But here's a Didymoceros, that's part of the coil there. So they had a body on them like a squid with the tentacles sticking out in here, and of course you don't really find the soft parts anymore. Well, here's two happy fossil collectors in here. Well, they collected a Didymoceros, and this fellow here has part of a Bacularides in here. Well, I don't know what this fellow found here, Benjamin, but notice the eyes on this guy. Well, there's the best of the fossil hunters. That's Bukai. Notice uh, Kathy put uh, little bootly booties on her dog there because the ground is covered with calcedony, which is a type of a, uh, it's a glass-like material, it'll cut the feet of one of you. But this fella here is one of the best of the fossil hunters. You ought to see him when he found one of those big titanothere leg bones. I mean. Well, here's a class, this goes back many years here. That's a vertebrate fossil collecting class. Here I am at younger days and that white patch on my nose is a break in the film. It's not that I got hit in the nose. And, put a Band-Aid on there. 
Well, here's the preparation laboratory. Now, whenever you collect all of this, then you've got to spend some time putting it together. Don't we have to reassemble these? Well, here's that tortoise that we found out there. We brought it into the laboratory, and it's been encased in a plaster of Paris jacket. Now you have to remove that with various knives and hacksaw blades, and then hoping that uh, you have something there that you can preserve. Well, they're working on this, examining the tortoise in here. And, uh, but what do we do now? I don't know. Once they got that apart, I don't think they did a very good job of taking off that plaster of Paris cast, but it, a lot of pieces fell out. So I don't know what happened to that. I think we took the pieces and we're using the scoots or the pieces in various laboratory exercises. Well, here's a young fossil collector. He's working on one of the specimens there, removing the matrix. And this can take some time. You have to remove all the matrix and try to bring the specimen out in relief. And of course, we use various types of paleo bond here. Notice this particular part of the jaw of a titanus there. Here it's full of cracks in here, so you have to cement those together. And now this fellow in here, he's never going to put that together. That's pretty obvious. That's an exercise in futility in here. But I don't know why they collect all of this, but then they bring it in and they say, what have I done? But here's the jaw of one of those titanotheres now, you see. It's mostly complete, but part of it is missing. But you see, here's a, uh, here's a couple of teeth over here. They're missing here. But these are bilaterally symmetrical, just like we are. One side is the same as the other. So if you find one side, you can reconstruct the other side. But then we have the teeth up in here, those so-called nipper teeth. I mean, what do we do about that? Well, there's been an abundance of literature, most of it back in the 1925, and they have excellent drawings of these showing where all these teeth fit together. So you go to the library, you get those particular uh, diagrams. So here we've reconstructed the teeth in here. But they had two large nipping teeth, and then certain species had two smaller ones right in the center. So we can reconstruct that. and. Uh, well, here's what it looked like after we got through rebuilding it in here. So it's a fine specimen in uh, it's a lower jaw, but we put it in the, made up a display, and we entered this in the Greater Kansas City Gem and Mineral Show, and we won a prize on it, and they, we call this Titus in here. Here's a specimen, and there's the jaw in here, and uh, then, of course, now this is where we keep all of our treasures in here at the uh, Blairsheim Hall at the Richard L. Sutton Museum of Geosciences. So you go through this door, and then you go down one floor to the second floor, room uh, 271, and that's our museum down there. And this is open to the public from about 8.30 in the morning to 4.30 in the afternoon. And uh, there's no charge. It's open during days when school is in session. And of course, uh, this is right on the door here. One good thing, but we've had at least about, the, since the 1970s, we've had about 10,000 people come through our museum. Most of them are school children. And we get sometimes two or three hundred of them a, uh, a uh, semester in here. So if you uh, want to come over, well, you can give me a call. If I'm there, I'll take you through. And if you have some children, I'll be glad to take a group through for you. So here's a class. And in incidentally, we've got one of the best collections of minerals, hundreds of minerals between the uh, best collection in any museum between Denver and uh, Chicago. We have an excellent uh, display of fossilized wood, and then we have some of the crinoids, which are, look like a lily, but they're really uh, 
part of a uh, animal. And uh, we have some specimens that were found in 1889 in downtown Kansas City. Those are on display. And of course, well, children, I like the children like the touch thing. And so you can touch anything in this museum. And here's our case with some of the specimens in it. Here's the lower jaw of the subhydrocket and the first true rhino. And uh, there's some more of them in here for you. Here's subhydrocketin, and here's the uh, lower jaw. This is the one that Benjamin found out there. It's been prepared, and it's in our museum. Here's the skull of a, a camel and the cast of a uh, oreodont. And we've got a few more things in there. So this is what you see when you come to our museum. Well, there's the... Uh, camel and the brain case in here. And of course, we have to put in a pledge for the collection authorized under special use permits by the U.S. Forest Service in here. Well, I don't know if that's a sunrise or a sunset, but they all look alive to me. But that's, uh, that's all I have for you. So if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them.